National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for February 2009. I'm Kristen Jenkins. Two thousand and nine is the bicentennial of Darwin's birth and the one hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. Organizations around the world are celebrating these events with symposia, lectures, theater performances, and art. It's rare for one person or idea to have the kind of impact Darwin's theory of evolution has had. The theory of evolution by natural selection provides the framework for our modern understanding of biology, and as such has been a key component in generating a vast array of benefits to society. How did Darwin come by his great theory? Why was he able to see what others had missed? And if Darwin had not developed his theory, would someone else have? The study of how scientific thought develops is the realm of philosophers of science. In this podcast, we talk with Dr. Elliot Sober, a professor of philosophy at the University of Wisconsin, about the development of Darwin's theory of evolution. My name is Elliot Sober. I'm a philosopher of science. I teach at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My interests are in scientific reasoning. Uh, how do scientists uh, test their theories? How do they connect theory and observation? How do they evaluate which theories are better and which are worse? And I'm interested not just in describing what practices are like and have been in the history of science, but in actually evaluating different methods that scientists use or might use and trying to figure out why the ones that are good are good and why the ones that are bad are bad. Dr. Sober, would you describe how major scientific theories are generated? People sometimes have the idea that scientific crea creativity uh, involves a lonely and isolated genius who just comes up with a new idea out of nothing at all, with no influences, no precedents, not building on the, the work of others. This is almost always not true, and it's not true in the case of Darwin. Darwin returned from the Beagle voyage in the mid-1830s and were started to work on a theory of the origin of species. By the 1840s, he had the theory of common ancestry and natural selection pretty much worked out. It was, he wanted more details, he wanted more evidence, but the structure was there. In 1858, he got a letter in the mail from a man named Alfred Russell Wallace. Wallace included in the with the letter a paper that he hoped Darwin would help him to publish. And Darwin was thunderstruck when he read this letter because there was Darwin's own theory independently discovered by Alfred Russell Wallace. Darwin quickly wrote a, a companion article stating the theory, and the two were published together. A year later, Darwin published The Origin of Species uh, as a fuller treatment of this theory. So if Wallace and Darwin independently came up with this theory, that suggests that there had to be something in the air that they were both breathing. There were some influences that led them to this same uh, discovery. What might those influences be? Here, here, there's some speculation, but also some documentation, because Darwin kept very good records about what he thought about what he read, and his correspondence was vast. Let me go back to uh, the 18th century and shift from biology to politics and economics. Adam Smith was an extremely influential economist who published a book called The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith described competition within a marketplace in which people uh, buy and sell, try to make the most money they ha can, and the best businesses survive where, whereas the, the, the less well-run businesses go extinct. One of the important ideas of, uh, of, in Adam Smith's model was that uh, this, in this competition of people in a marketplace, people are selfish. People care only about their own well-being. But Adam Smith thought that as a side effect or a byproduct of, uh, of competition, the wealth of nations would be enhanced. That's the title of Smith's book. So people are only out to get the most that they can for themselves. But a side effect 
of competition is that something improves. And this was, a, for Darwin, a model of the idea of natural selection. Uh, organisms are, as we might say, trying to, to reproduce and survive in their environment. They don't care about the survival of the species or the good of the ecosystem. But an unintended byproduct of this competition is that something improves, namely the adaptedness of organisms to their environment. So this is an example of how an idea from outside of biology influence the development of a biological idea. Karl Marx uh, noted this when he said of Darwin that uh, Darwin was merely applying to nature what Darwin saw all around him in the English economy. Another and more triggering moment in Darwin's development of the idea was his reading an, another essay in Politics and Economics by Thomas Malthus, uh, he read this in, in the 1830s. Malthus's essay was about people, not about the rest of nature. And Malthus's idea was that human beings have more babies than there is food to feed them. And the inevitable effect of this is that populations grow too fast and there's starvation, which then cuts back the population uh, to a level at which there is enough food, but then people have more babies. And so this is, this is the, the process that Malthus thought was inescapable, inevitable. Uh, it's the reason there always will be poor people. Malthus thought it was a very pessimistic view of human society. Uh, Darwin saw in this a model for what he came to call the superabundance of nature. Think how many apples an apple tree produces every year. Thousands of apples, far more than can ever uh, produce uh, trees. Most of those seeds die. So this was a, another source for Darwin of the idea that nature is a war. It's a war of competition in which vastly more organisms are born than could possibly survive. Death has to be an important part. Wide-scale death has to be a pervasive fact about nature. And this was a precondition for, the, for Darwin for the... Um, occurrence of natural selection. Not everybody can live. The organisms that are better able to survive and reproduce will be the ones that manage to do so. It's interesting that economic theories provided such a clear parallel to events in the natural world. Were there cultural practices or applications that also influenced Darwin's thinking? Another source for Darwin was what he called artificial selection. Uh, Darwin s studied in great detail the work of plant and animal breeders over, the, over centuries in shaping domesticated animals and plants. Pet dogs, dairy cattle, and wheat and corn were all changed by plant and animal breeders deciding to, to use some individuals as the, as the parents for the next generation, but not others. And by doing this, vast changes had been effected in a relatively short amount of time. And Darwin had the idea that if human beings acting over a small number of centuries could change wolves into dogs, uh, could change dairy cattle, then natural selection working over much vaster reaches of time could produce even bigger changes. So here he was drawing on far, the experience and records of farming um, as a model for what he thought was going on in nature. What else about Darwin's culture might have contributed to his ideas about evolution? I've just described two influences on Darwin that led him to the idea of natural selection. I want to say something about Darwin's sources for the idea of common ancestry, the other key part of his own theory. Well, we all know about family trees, and uh, Darwin and his society were very, very interested in ancestry, perhaps more than some of us are today. Uh, people were proud of their ancestry. They had documents that proved who their ancestors were. Uh, to say something bad about someone's ancestor was a slur, an attack on, on, on you and your character. Uh, so the idea of family trees was uh, just out there as something in which Darwin and his, and his group 
took a great deal of interest. Uh, plant and animal breeders kept family trees of the cattle and dogs that, and racehorses that they bred. And that was out there where you could see the descent with modification that occurred from one generation to another. Darwin was also aware of the fact that languages have family trees. We all think of the Romance languages as tracing back to a common ancestor, namely Latin, and of other languages tracing back to common ancestry. English and German have a common ancestor and so on. So the idea that cultural objects have an ancestry and trace back to common ancestors was, it was obvious to Darwin. It was a model for him when he thought about organisms in nature, differences among species, species trace back to common ancestors, just like languages do. And he also was aware of the fact that texts uh, that come in different versions should be traced back to common ancestors. The Bible has different versions. These trace back to a single source, and, and biblical scholars since the 17th century and even before try to reconstruct what the, what the ancestral form of the Bible was. What was the Bible like thousands of years ago? What did it say? How do you explain the differences, the small differences that occur among different versions of the Bible? Classical scholars ask the same question about um, documents from ancient Greece. They're different versions of the Iliad, of Homer. How do we reconstruct what the Ur-text, the first version of, of that book, was like? So the idea of historical reconstruction, of tracing things now back to common ancestors and speculating about what the characteristics of those earlier forms were, was out there as part of the, uh, the, the culture that, that Darwin lived in. Uh, human beings have family trees, racehorses have family trees, languages have family trees. Uh, texts uh, have family trees also, and this was a model that Darwin applied to the whole of nature. This is where he got the idea of common ancestry. He didn't make it up. It was out there for anyone to use. The genius of Darwin's theory was to take these ideas uh, that were out there for anybody to look at, the idea of natural selection, the idea of common ancestry, and to bring them together into such a powerful theory. It's clear from this interview that science and society are inextricably intertwined. Scientists are products of their cultures, and the scientific information they generate influences the course of society. Darwin was not the first person to think about evolution, but fortunately he was immersed in a society that provided examples and models for him to apply to the problem of how biological change occurs. These influences, combined with Darwin's keen intellect and wide-ranging curiosity about the world, have given us a powerful way to understand the biological world through Darwin's theory of evolution. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.